Next on Lectures in History, Tulane University professor John Ray Proctor teaches a class about playwright August Wilson, his contribution to African-American theater, and his Pulitzer Prize-winning play, Fences. Today we're going to look at August Wilson's um, Fences. We're going to begin with a very brief discussion about who and what August Wilson was, his goal as a playwright. Um, I'm going to repeat some stuff that you have heard before from our in-class presentation from Semhall, um, but there's going to be some stuff that I'm going to talk about in a little bit more depth than we talked about uh, last class. On Thursday, you guys are going to look at T-Bone and Weasel. I really hope you all read that and prepare to do that. I'm going to give you uh, your very quick pop quiz. The pop quiz for Fences should be easy as we will be done discussing it, but we're going to take it so that you guys can get a grade for it. And you will also have the pop quiz for uh, T-Bone and Weasel. Let's start with um, August Wilson. August Wilson was born Frederick August Kittel or Kittle in April 20, on April 27th of 1945. His mother's name was Daisy Wilson. She was a cleaning lady. Cleaning lady. His father's name was Frederick August Kittel. He was a German baker. I want you guys to pay attention. Race matters in a very specific way. Race is always one of the things that we're discussing as we look at these plays. So. His father, Frederick August Kittel, was a German baker, so he's white, or he's European. And then his mother is a black woman named uh, Daisy, right? And she's a cleaning lady. I want you to understand, so we're, we're already talking about a mixed relationship. When, so his, uh, his mixed identity is a part of what he's um, working on when he's writing. Like, how he is negotiating African-American existence is a part of who and what he is as he's working as an artist and as a writer. It's part of the mission that he's undertaking. Um, he is the fourth of six children, um, so, and they live in uh, the Hill District of Pencil, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A lot of what Wilson's going to talk about deals with the Great Migration. I've mentioned that in this class before. The, the Great Migration um, is what happened after uh, Reconstruction in the South um, when the social status of black people moved from uh, slavery to freed to the Reconstruction era to sharecropping. So sharecropping was this new kind of or new name for, I don't think it's quite accurate for me to say slavery, but essentially that's what it becomes. Uh, we've talked in this room about what sharecropping is, right? Good, thank you. Um, and it's, it's just a system where the black people who used to be the slaves on the, on the plantation are now in a position where they are, they are renting what used to be the slave cabins. They are renting the clothes. They are renting the tools to go work for the same arms on which they were enslaved. And they enter this system in which they're never able to actually pay for um, pay for the rental fees for the things that they're now using to till the land. So that's why the great, that's one of the motivating factors that caused a number of blacks to move nor, uh, northward at the turn of the century and pursue a better life in the north. I want you guys to think for just a couple of minutes about what that does or what that means for black families in the south. Was it whole families moving north or was it more often than not uh, the man who would go north or the eldest son who would go from the southern states to the northern states and their purpose was to uh, make money that they could send home. That's always the goal. You'll find a number of people in Pittsburgh, in New York, and in Chicago who have come north looking to make a fortune so that they can either make enough money so that their families can come up to the north and live with them in the north or so they can send money home so that the people that, they, that, that are their people down there could have a way of living. So understand that one of the things that Wilson is talking about, uh, one of the things that informs what Wilson is talking about is the Great Migration. Um, in Pittsburgh, because these rural areas are now dealing with an influx of black people, 
there are racial tensions that start to get built at the, at the turn of the century and afterwards. Um, the racial tensions include white neighborhoods in which black presences hadn't been before, in which now you have a, 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 a growing poor black population who need things to live. They need jobs. They need food. They need shelter because it's cold. It's colder in Pittsburgh than it was in South Carolina or in Georgia. And the black people who have now migrated north are, they, they get to a point where they're like, how do we live? Where do we, where do we, how do we feed ourselves? How do we clothe ourselves? These become the primary concerns. Understand that all of those things are what are informing fences when we finally get to it. Um, so in, at the age of 15 in 1960, he drops out of high school and he uh, joins the army in 1962 for three years. And I want to take just a second and talk about what that means. Why, why today do we have uh, black, black people? I, I can't give you the real percentages. I would be making stuff up and lying to you. Uh, but I believe there's a higher percentage of black people in our current military than uh, other races. What are some of the motiva motivating factors for joining the military? What does it give you? He is unmarried at this point. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, don't a lot of like army recruits go to like poor black neighborhoods or like poor neighborhoods of people of color to go recruit um, like black and brown kids? So. And like, kind of like, push the education opportunity, like getting paid, and um, using that as like a, a force to kind of bring more, because like they wouldn't get it from like rich white kids. So it's like right. So I, I just want you to understand that uh, Semhal's point was, or what what her question had to do with, was uh, she believes that recruiting agencies go to poor black neighborhoods and recruit black people in greater numbers uh, than they do in rich white neighborhoods. That's that is a fact of today, uh, may have been a fact in the 1960s, but it's a, it's a job, it's a good job. It provides money, it provides an income, it provides a steady income, right? And you're risking your life, yes, but that's part of this. That's part of this. Um, think about the institutions that take black men away from their families outside of prison and what will become uh, the incarceration, the insane incarcera incarceration rates based around things that happened in the 80s. But we have to go back and look at the systems that moved black men away from their families. The army was one of them, or the armed services were one of them. But it wasn't, it wasn't in a cruel way. I think they were offered this opportunity. They said, hey, Here's an opportunity for you to get three meals a day, <coughs> place to sleep, training, education, um, and we will. And, and you know, you can send a check home to your family. So that is one of the opportunities for employment and advancement that happened during uh, when Wilson was at this point. He would have been about 18 years old, but he's in the army for three years. Um, after he leaves the armies in the late 1960s, he comes back uh, to the Pittsburgh area and he joins a group of artists and they form the Center Avenue Poets, uh, which will later become, uh, later he will co-found the Black Horizon Theater, which is a black national theater company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, in 19, some, so, and he stays in Pittsburgh until I think 1974, 1975, and then he begins to move westward. He spends a couple years in Chicago, and then he moves in 1978 to uh, Minnesota. And he joins, uh, and he's gonna concentrate on playwriting in Minnesota, and he joins the Penumbra Theater, and the artistic director for the Penumbra Theater is Lou Bellamy. The Penumbra Theater is a black, owned black oriented and black centered theater company in Minnesota. Uh, why is that name of the name of the town in Minnesota flying out of my head right now? Um, I used to work. My, my brain's trying to say Fargo, Minnesota, but it's not Fargo. Minneapolis, that would be the name of the giant town in Minnesota that I can't think of right now. So the Penumbra Theater is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and he's working with Lou Bellamy. Understand that uh, August Wilson gets to a point in his life where 
what he's writing about is the lives of black people. And I want, to, I want you guys to think for just a couple of minutes about why that's happening. Why is it significant, and in what way is it significant, that he is writing about the lives of black people? We've talked in this class before about the shift between white artists writing black voices. What does it mean when a, write, a white playwright writes a character, writes a black character into a play? What, is, is, what does their voice sound like? Is it authentic? What is, it that, what is the character's purpose? Black characters who are appearing in white movies become a thing. I'm going to jump just a little bit to talk about the um, popular culture that's influencing the way August Wilson is thinking about plays and writing and the presentation of black people. But I'm only going to sh jump for just a couple seconds. I want to talk for a uh, second about the popular culture of the 1980s. So in the 1980s, what are the things that are informing and I'm talking about the 1980s because August Wilson will ultimately talk about, uh, we're, we're going to talk about fences, but let's talk about the things that were informing the way Wilson was thinking about the world. So in the mid to, in the beginning to the late, like 1980 to 1986, 1987, what are the popular images that are influencing what Wilson is seeing? Uh, you've got the movies include E.T., Return of the Jedi, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Beverly Hills Cop, Breakfast Club, Pretty in Pink, um, and Some Kind of Wonderful. I know that most of these movies came out before you all were born. Are you at all familiar with uh, these series of movies? Have you heard of them before? If you think about things like The Breakfast Club, if you think about things like Pretty in Pink, I think his name is John Hughes, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, John Hughes is making a whole genre and it's, we talked about what ideology means in this room before. Ideology are those unspoken and sometimes less clear structures that influence the way people think about America, the way women should behave, the way men should behave, what it means to be straight, what it means to be gay, what it means to be a whole lot of things. No one says it outright, but it's always... It's, it's unspoken underlying structures that inform the way we think about race and identity and class and gender. That makes sense? Good. So if you've got movies like Pretty in Pink and Some Kind of Wonderful, and I think there's a movie with John Cusack holding up a boombox that I can't... High Fidelity? I don't think it's High Fidelity. I can't remember what it is. But you have all of these as the biggest movies that are coming out in the 80s. And the primary concern in this, these movies, for, for a lot of, I think this is technically the beginnings of rom-com. Uh, I'm, I'm not a cinema professor, I can't tell you the truth of that. But white women, white men falling in love. Those are what a lot of those stories are about. Overcoming rejection, overcoming obstacles, overcoming blah, blah, blah. So most of our movies in the 80s are dealing with white folks falling in love. Think for just a couple seconds about how we, people of color, African-American people, appear in those films. Give it just a little bit of consideration. We are more often than not marginal or tangential. We are someone else in that story, right? So when we finally make it to August Wilson, we have an instance of... Our, so the things that are motivating August Wilson are his desire to move black people from the margins to the center and say, what's true about us? What matters to us? What's happening in our lives? Because when we're just on the margins... What we have to say is maybe not, it's not part of the main story. And so it becomes this caricature where we're saying the funny lines. Like I said, we've got, prior to this, we've got George Jefferson who appear, who began as a marginal character in uh, the, it's not called the Archie Bunker show, but it was Archie Bunker. Um, and then we've got good times, black people showing up in comedy, black people's lives in popular culture for a very long time was something that you laughed at, not laughed with, but laughed at, right? We were the joke, we were the comedy. Think about Eddie Murphy, who's trying, is, I don't know if any of you have ever looked at or read his early comedy, but think about what that's rooted on. 
and it's different. Black people, black comedians, black people creating black comedy for black people is a different experience than black people appearing in largely white structures and being as something to be laughed at. So I want you guys to consider how that works. Uh, on television, we've got Roseanne, Married with Children. Uh, VCRs become a thing in the 1980s. MTV, uh, believe it or not, at one point in time, music television began with music. Like that's uh, Video killed the radio star. I think it was 1986 or somewhere around there. I was a high school student, and we all know. You all are looking at me with vacant expressions, like for real. The very first song that ever played on MTV, and I don't know it because of a Trivial Pursuit card, was Video Killed the Radio Star. I can't tell you who did that song, but I know that that was the song. Um, and Michael Jackson's Thriller. Think about Michael Jackson in the 1980s. This is how black people are represented in art becomes, becomes a thought that people are taking are doing on purpose. People are, people are really considering. What happened, black artists, black playwrights, black, song, uh, black songwriters, black performers are, I'm not saying that they are embracing black identity, but they're becoming critical and critically analyzing black identity in a way that is a response to the black exploitation sp f uh, films of the 1970s, in response to, um, the civil rights movement of the 1960s, we always have to look at things in relationship to each other. We've got the 1960s and what happened during the civil rights movement. We can go back further and look at the 1950s. And we, again, look at Emmett Till's mother who realized the value of performance by keeping Emmett Till's casket open. Uh, that was an act of performance. She was like, you won't, this won't happen behind closed doors anymore. Think about private voice versus public voice. What does it mean when we are forced to keep something in private, as opposed to what happens when we make it public. Think about the developments in technology that have happened between the 1950s and the 1980s. Think about uh, the advancements we make in telephone. Think about the advancements we get in recording, uh, recording technologies. Think about the advancements we've made in film and television itself. For example, and the way that should make sense to you guys now, there are uh, videos every time something happens out there. If somebody meets you in, in the grocery store parking lot and they start acting funny toward you, the first thing, what's the first thing that happens? What is the first thing that happens if you are in a public space and something, and you think things are going to go bad? That's not a rhetorical question. You can leave, yes. Somebody pulls out a phone and starts recording. We have all of these instances right now of things that used to happen in, without any evidence, but now there's evidence, right? There's evidence not only from local street cameras, but every individual, everybody in this room has their own phone. So they have a way of documenting their existence and that these crazy things happen to us, right? Because that's, that's what an African-American existence becomes for a while. We say to the public, you are treating us in this way. And oftentimes <coughs> what, what comes back is people go, what, what, it can't be that bad. You are exaggerating. Well, now, now we get to the point where our phone comes out. We're like, we're not exaggerating. This is what's happening. And so then what happens subsequently is this weird justification. Oh, I have to understand the context for that right? Uh, that, that was taken out of context. You know, maybe it wasn't taken out of context. So when we get back to August Wilson in the 1980s, the things that are informing his artistic vision and his life as a writer include all of those pop culture reference that I talked to you. And so he's seeing a large, what's, what's informing his television and his movie habits. He's like, that's, that's white people's world. Who's writing about us? And when they write about us, what are they saying? That's what's driving him as, as a playwright. Good. So let's talk about, really briefly, I'm going to go through the contextualization of the 1980s. A lot of this is stuff that I was alive for, and we have a different relationship to this. Like, I realized as I was putting this up here this morning that you guys are going to look at a lot of the stuff that I'm about to say as stuff that only ever existed in a history book, um, but... I was in high school 
from essentially here on, right? So everything that I'm talking about are things that I have a memory of having happened while I was in high school. So I was a little bit younger than where you guys are right now. So in 1980, Mount St. Helens explodes. I can't begin to tell you what the images of the ash pouring all over, all over those people looked like. And it was on my television for days. Images of people covered in ash. We all saw it. It's what informed us. Uh, in, on October 10th, 1980, 80, President uh, Jimmy Carter signed uh, legislation establishing the Boston African American National Historic Site. Uh, it's the oldest black church in America, and, that's in, and that happened in the 1980s. It was on the news. Uh, January 20th, 1981, it's the inauguration of Ronald Reagan, who is the 40th President of the United States. This matters in... Um, I'm not an economics professor, but Reaganomics is something that you can look up and look at how it affected the world. Um, one of the things that is the most important part about that that we'll talk about later deals with the tax cut in which we went from, I think, a 70% tax rate on... Uh, there's a way to say it that I don't know what it is, but there's a 70% tax rate, tax rate that gets dropped to like 37 or 35% from the wealthiest people in the country. Over the course of five years, we lose, as a country, 750 million? Yeah, billion, sorry, not million, billion. Over five years, we as a country lose $750 billion in tax revenue based on something, but based on this bill that was signed by Ronald Reagan. Uh, March 30th, 1981, uh, someone tried to kill Ronald Reagan. Um, everybody knew about it. The, I'm only talking about the things that showed up on the news for days. Um, April 12, 1981 is the launch of the first launch from the space shuttle in Cape Canaveral. Um, January 29th, Reagan's tax cuts cost, seven, cost America $750 billion over the next five years. September 12, 1981, Sandra, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor becomes the first female justice of uh, the Supreme Court. These are big stories that we couldn't not see. So I'm absolutely positive on some level these stories impacted or were in the, were in the awareness of August Wilson. I don't even say that it necessarily impacted fences, but these are the things that he's thinking about. So as you guys think about what the themes are in fences, and as we move from the deeply personal to the public, I want you to th think about the way the public is becoming aware because of the way uh, the way the the public's growing awareness of the world, of the nation, of the national identity. Um, March second, nineteen eighty two, the Senate passes a bill eliminating the practice of busing to to achieve racial integration. So busing stops in nineteen eighty two. Uh, was racism fixed? in 1982? No, I don't think it was. Busing was born as a way to, to I think that busing was initial, uh, initially built as a way to um, integrate blacks and whites. It, it, was, it had to do with equality. Do you all remember? What do you know of that from history? Why we bust those, do you, uh, we talked about this a couple of classes ago. A couple of classes ago. Um, the one black young woman who had to go to school in Mississippi and the 5,000 National Guard people who went to Mississippi just so she could go to school. So that would have been... So 1954, 1955? 1954, 1955. All of these things are related to each other. Black people being allowed to go to largely white institutions, being allowed to. And we in this room have to think very specifically about what that means for us. We here at Tulane, looking at the racial demographics of Tulane, have to consider, have to always consider what that means to us. We are a part of this history. Uh, September 20th, 1984, The Cosby Show premieres. Um, and we've talked about that in this room. The Cosby Show is one of the first times we have the representation of a black doctor, black male doctor married to a black female lawyer, and they have five kids who are all... Uh, successful and professional and uh, living life in a way that is that is not abject poverty that is not just a joke that is not in constant pain the things that concern the the Cosby family we have to consider what their primary concerns are 
Uh, we can think about Vanessa, who was looking for a boyfriend. Uh, very smart. It, it became layered. It became what black people are was something new because of the Cosby Show. 1985, uh, Bob Geldorf raises $70 million uh, for relief in Ethiopia. He does this with a giant concert, a giant televised concert. Um, 1986, for the very first time, January 20th, 1986, Martin Luther King is officially, the Martin Luther King holiday is officially rec recognized for the first time. January 28th, 1986, the Challenger space shuttle explodes, killing seven astronauts. I rem it's, it's one of those things. I'm 50 years old now, and I can remember where I was when this happened. I was in high school. I was, this was my senior year of high school. Um, how old were you guys? Do you, have a, do you have a memory of 2011, of what happened to the world on September, ele September 11th, 2001? Do you guys remember that? Do you have images of the towers falling in your head? Okay. Uh, just a generational thing. There are several things that have happened in our country and in the world that we as, as, uh, as people, we got images fed to us on television. One of those for me was the um, explosion of the Challenger space shuttle. We watched it launch and just moments later we watched it explode. And we watched seven astronauts disintegrate. We watched it as a nation. In 2000, uh, 2001, September 11th, we watched airplanes hit the Twin Towers uh, in New York, and then we watched in real time towers fall on fire, and we watched it happen. So I'm, I'm, I find it interesting that as a group of people, you guys were too young to have a memory of where you were at those times. Um, and then May 25th, 1986, uh, I included this one, Hands Across America. Uh, the 80s were a special, special time. Um, but you guys should have a reference for Hands Across America as of last week. What is your reference for Hands Across America? It's Jordan Peele's Us. Good. So when I want you to think about the things that are, have global impact, that's one of them. So, this is the world that is informing August Wilson as he is writing the play Fences. One more thing to talk about, and then we're going to discuss Fences as a class. I want to talk about the Pittsburgh Cycle. The Pittsburgh Cycle is a series of ten plays that August Wilson undertook to move black, black identity, black concerns, black lives from the margins to the center. He did it on purpose. His goal, it wasn't that he was necessarily, he held, he may or may not have held animosity for white America, but white America isn't the central concern of his plays. White people are not the central concern of his plays. Black lives, black identity, black, black existence gets moved to the center of his plays and his playwriting. The Pittsburgh cycle begins in, uh, well, it's different. So he premiered with uh, Jitney. Uh, the first play he wrote was called Jitney. It premiered in 1982. The second play he wrote was Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. It was set in 1927, but it premiered in 1984. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom is an amazing play. It's a wonderful play that deals with, I think, five black musicians um, and uh, one black female singer, uh, named Ma Rainey. Black, uh, she's, uh, do you guys know who Big Mama Thornton is? Have you ever heard of Big Mama Thornton? Okay. Uh, you should look up Big Mama Thornton. If you are just hanging out at your house, listening, doing homework, you might want to listen to Big Mama Thornton. Uh, you could actually listen to Ma Rainey. You can go back and go, oh, Ma Rainey is, they, they're a different type of singer, uh, you will get Nina Simone, but Nina Simone is kind of crossing over into a what to mainstream. Ma Rainey was. We do have a contemporary reference for Ma Rainey, if you will, even here in New Orleans. Have you ever seen Miss Doreen play in the Quarter? Y'all need to go to the Quarter at some point in time and listen to uh, Miss Doreen. She plays clarinet. You'll begin to have an understanding of who 
uh, Ma Rainey was if you go listen and, and talk to Ms. Doreen. She's amazing. Um, but after Ma Rainey's, then we've got Joe Turner's Come and Gone, uh, which premiered in 1984, and it was set in 1911. And then finally we get to Fences, which is set in 1957, but it uh, premiered in 1987. We're going to talk about Fences in just a second. Um, and he also wrote The Piano Lesson, Two Trains Running, Seven Guitars, King Headley, Gem of the Ocean, and Radio Golf. And I think Clybourne Park. If I'm not mistaken, he also includes Clybourne Park. <sighs> Let's talk about Fences. Um, August Wilson is influenced and in conversation with more artists than just playwrights. I know that all of these things inform him, and at some point in time he moves away, he doesn't, he stops, he stops concerning himself with white representation, and he specifically begins to seek out black representation and black art. One of the artists that uh, he specifically looked to was Romare Bearden. Here, let me show you. So, so that... I didn't break it, and I'm really proud of that. <laughs> I have a question about Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Does that have to do with like sexuality? Ma Rainey's Black Bottom? Yes. In fact, uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom it does, in fact, have to do with sexuality. And for, uh, for a while, Ma Rainey had a... One of the other characters in the play is Dussie May. And Dussie May is an opportunist, a young woman who is an opportunist who has um, built a relationship with Ma. Um, and the play tells you the play intimates that it is of a sexual nature. Okay. So, yes, dealing with that is a part of, part of that as well. Like the train, the serpent, the guitar. But these are all natural things that I saw. When I uh, first began to do collages, I had no idea that I was going to develop certain symbols that have run through my work, like the train, the serpent, the guitar. But these were all natural things that I saw. I used to life around Mecklenburg County in North Carolina. So black people had to do with the train. So these are the, are the elements of my environment. That's right. You know, I used the train because so many of the lives of black people had to do with the train. So these are the, are the elements of my environment. A screen up. Bring the African American bring the African-American experience or bring the universal to the African-American experience. What is significant about bringing the universal to the African-American experience? What is significant to you about an attempt to bring the universal to the African-American experience? Yes, sir. But like, it makes it something that like, everyone can understand. Like, it makes it easier for you to, like, um, I guess, relate to it to the story, like, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, or whatever, like, you can relate to it more. How does the idea of empathy impact what you were saying? Um, well, people feel more empathy towards, like, black people, they would try and, like, help out with more of the issues that are going on in the community, okay. I feel like. Making the black experience understandable. We have, we all have children. Right? I think about Trayvon Martin. Every time I think about August Wilson, I'm stuck. And August Wilson's, uh, sorry, August Wilson's artistic purpose, I find myself thinking about Trayvon Martin. And I want to know why, why the newspaper, why the media depicted him as such a monster deserving of such treatment. 
when all I saw was a 17-year-old boy who had been followed home, right? Empathy. That's what, ideo that's what ideology has to do with. If ideologically we can construct the black experience as something that is hostile, something that is aggressive, something that is violent, then the treatment of black people becomes justified by our criminal justice systems, right? But if we can perform the narrative of blackness in such a way that it becomes universal, then maybe there can be empathy. Maybe then we can get more, we can get the rest of America to go, you know what? This, this demonizing of blackness that has happened on an ideological level, let's step away from that and let's find out, and, oh, they, that's just a mother and that's a son. When we look at uh, Rose and we look at Troy in Fences, we're hearing the story of a man and a woman, right? They don't, they don't really concern themselves with the white world around them. That's not their, they're concerned with their lives. And that process of exposing or showing the deeply personal by showing the specific and personal, it's an attempt to make that story universal, right? Oh, a husband and wife. It's not about this black husband and this wife. Is it, or I guess that's my question for you guys, is this story specifically about this black man and this black woman, or is it about men and women? Do you understand my question? Okay. Yes, Jamiron. I feel like it's about men and women. And like, they're really, they're really just like symbols of, of African American men and African American women and how like we interact with each other. Okay. And I feel like it, it probably shows like more of a private life of Afri African American experience. Okay. And how and how like husband, African American husband and wife interact with each other. Would you say that fences humanizes the black experience? Uh I in a brutal way I, I say I say it do. Like uh in a direct way. From uh from his dialogue to like towards from um the main character, African American man, his dialogue towards his children. And, uh, and his wife. Okay. So let me ask you guys this. What are the... I'll be, yes, ma'am. Uh, I was just going to say that I think that the play is about um, a shared experience of oppression from black, uh, that black men and women both go through, as well as, like, like, what's intertwined with the way that they, like, the relationship between black men and women at home inside the home, like, you know, the way um, they have their own forms of, like, I guess, oppression for, for, like, a man to a woman, like, some of the things that she was going through with her husband, Troy, okay. and the way he was treating her, it was very, like, misogynistic. It would just be like, go get, go get this for me, woman, like, you know, it was a lot of that. Okay, so let's talk about this for just a second. I am not contesting you. Thank you for a great comment. This is my question. We can describe the relationship between uh, Troy and Rose as oppressive, right? We can describe that as misogynistic. So take just a couple seconds and tell me from the play, give me an example from the play of what you think or what you would describe as oppressive or misogynistic. I d I'm not saying you are wrong. I'm asking everybody to, to support that, answer, that, that position. What were some specific examples from the play that you might describe as misogynistic or abusive? <laughs> um, the fact that he just expected Rose to wait on him, like get him whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted it, like, or, yeah. So Rose uh, doing as she was told to go, yes. Yes, absolutely, you are 100% correct. Um, I think it, I think that that is a reflection of the state of uh, women in the domestic, domestic sphere. So this play was set in 1957. 
We have to think about things like I Love Lucy, uh, Leave it to Beaver, Good Times, and the idea of the American dream, right? What was a woman's role in a household in 1957? What was a woman's role? And even me saying that isn't necessarily true because we have to, like, when I say there were broader things that happened in the world, when all the, when a huge number of men left the country to go fight in World War II and then came back, women went and worked. When all the men left the country to go fight in a war, women went to work. This image that we have of the woman with, the, the white woman with the stocking, with the rag on her head, doing the thing, that was uh, a symbol for, Ro I think, Rosie the Riveter. So women went to factories and then they came home. And so who and what female meant and what the domestic sphere meant is being questioned. It, it, women had a different lived experience because of World War II. And then the other thing that happens after World War II is uh, the McCarthy era when you could be in trouble for, be, you could be called, being called a communist was the worst thing ever. You could appear before the House of Un-American Activities Committee, right? So that's, that was a thing that was a boogeyman that was used to scare a lot of Americans into what, I can't even say the government, into proper behavior, right? And women had their place. That's not right. Or the, th there was an idea in American culture that women had their place. Women had, and their place was in the home. Uh, there are things that we would look at and call utterly crazy. Uh, magazines, uh, specifically for white women, about what <laughs> having your man's drink ready when he came home from work, having uh, being dressed nice, wearing a pair of heels and stockings, and having a full face of makeup on. These things were in magazines. I, I've seen them. They all exist. Um, and we can go back and look at them. Primarily, and this was a rhetoric that was being taught specifically to white women, and black women were trying to figure out how we fit into the American society. Black women's hair is a part of that story. Black women's jobs are a part of that story. Going out and being domestics, caring for white people's kids, all of that is a part of this story. How, we f how black American identity fits into the fabric of American society is all a part of this story. You were going to say? I was going to say I still see like remnants of like that in my grandmother and in the way that she carries herself. Um, for one, she like put rollers in her hair every single night. For as long as I've lived, I've never seen her miss a night. I don't know how she does it, um, and I bet that's so uncomfortable, but um, also, it, we cannot have guests if the house is messy. Like, you know, that's the thing. Like, you have, you have to uphold this image that you are very well kept, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, again, it's that public versus private. If your house is messy, people can't come in. I also don't ever remember my grandmother going to bed without rollers in her hair. Either. And I remember as a boy thinking, how do you sleep on that? <laughs> it's not comfortable at all. But that, that idea of presentation, what would you say Ruth's primary concern is in this play? Anybody I've not heard from. Yes, Neil. Mostly maintaining the family. Maintaining the family. The most important thing to Ruth in this play is maintaining the family, right? Uh, me. Yeah. Uh, I think also like maintaining the image that they're like a happy family, kind of. Maintaining the image. Are they a happy family? I mean, uh, in my opinion, no. She. I w I was say it got to the point where they aren't. They, I mean, they've had problems, and even, like, when the baby came about, she would, like, she tried to still have, like, a family presence, but she just, like, neglected her duties, I guess, as being a wife, so I wouldn't say that's, like, a complete family. Let's back up. You said neglected her duties as being a wife. Well, which duties are you talking about? As far as, like, or not, or as far as, uh, I guess, being there for her husband in, like, whatever capacity she was before. 
being there for her husband and like whatever. doing things that she would like normally do as a wife like when she found out about the baby it was like all right i'll take care of the baby but like kind of you know you're not on your own but like you won't get the same i'm i'm not sleeping with you anymore yeah like you're not that's that's no longer a thing that's no longer a thing yeah so I, I mean, I guess like maintain. It, but she she, she was, burned that bridge. Yeah, but she still like did her. She still would be a mother to the child and like still care for her children. So I guess it is still like maintaining the family, but just like not in a holistic approach. Is that? Is did she respond? To, did she say? Is is that? You have shown me such disrespect that that I can't. I'm not. I will no longer share my person. I will no longer share my body with you because that is the only thing I have. Like, what would it have... Could she have left him? Really? I mean, I I'm know. just curious. Where, where would she go? And I don't think she had that much money. Like, I don't think she had that anything. much money. She's stuck. But that's her reality. And I don't know that she necessarily thought of it as being stuck. People didn't really get divorces. Yeah. And people didn't get divorces. That wasn't, maybe that wasn't an option. And there's, a, there's another part in like maintaining this perfect family image. Identity. It also has to do with her identity. My identity, that thing that tells me who I am, is your wife, Troy. It's the mother of this per. He has, and Troy, this is Troy's second relationship from which he has kids, right? She's already wife number two. What were her options? What were her options as a black woman in 1957? She had few. She had few, if any. She had few, if any. Making, I don't want to say that it was making the most of a bad situation. I think it's family. I think it's family. financial situations like you said she really didn't have much money so why leave something that is somewhat financially stable more stable than you would be on your own than you know just staying okay I feel like that factors into it as well so what does family mean think about your own families do you have cousins sisters brothers how bad do you guys have family members that have maybe crossed a line? I have them. <laughs> Bull, you don't have family. Tell me, tell me, nobody in your family has, has pushed the boundaries of what family means? Nobody. Okay. I, will, I believe you. Um, I have relatives who are in jail. I have relatives. I have... How many of you, just a quick show of hands, how many of you know uh, a man or a woman in your family who has cheated? <laughs> Does cheating mean the relationship's over? <laughs> just, you figure, that's grown folks, right? You figure, out, you figure out how to get to what happens next when you're there. Rose was figuring that out. Um... Fences. Let's talk about uh, fences. Let's talk about the, what is a fence? Really quickly, you guys, what exactly, let's, the, the, this is not trying to trick you, what's a fence? Something that keeps someone in or out. It's something that keeps someone in or out. Barrier. It's a barrier or a boundary. Okay. What is Troy's activity? What is he trying to do? Jordan, what is it that Troy is trying to do through this whole play? Build or finish a fence. Right. Good. What else? At the beginning of the play, there's a baseball bat that is uh, leaning against a tree trunk. Do you all remember that? Good. Troy has an image in his head of what he was supposed to be. Remember? He says, I was just born at the wrong time. What does that mean? Can I ask you to speak up? My bad. Uh, saying, like, basically, like, black people weren't, like, allowed to 
play baseball professionally and stuff like that. So, like, he grew up in an era where he had to, like, just be like, all right, forget the sports and stuff. Let me go work a nine-to-five so I can take care of my family. Right. So some of it has to do with what he perceives as a man's responsibility, right? I could have been... I, I, I can't remember the line exactly, but I think it's something like, you know, I could have been, his dream is I could have been a great baseball player if I didn't have to do this. So he has this perception that the fortunes of a black man have shifted from when he was younger to where he is now, right? Good. The set is described as a dilapidated front porch, right? Or, sorry, back porch. Um, Why? Why do you think most of this play takes place on the porch? That's where you see a lot of black people grow up. A lot of black people grow up on the porch, yes. That's not me being funny. I mean, I get it. Uh, it has to do with community, right? It has to do with... When I moved down here to New Orleans, I didn't realize that porch sitting was an actual thing. But porch sitting is an actual thing. You sit out on the porch when it gets too hot. You're like, hey... Say hey to all your neighbors, hey. <laughs> and they're just walking by, hey. And if you don't say hey, you uppity. Mm -hmm. Oh, you must be from up north. <laughs> People who just sit outside, there's a sense of community, right? Good. Um, but the, the porch is unfinished. Troy has a way of not following through. Troy has a way of not finishing what he's started. Right? Troy has a way of not completing the relationship that he invested in. Because he goes off and finds another woman and has another baby. Troy has a way of not being present in his own life. Right? How do you, do you guys have a response to that idea? What do you think of that idea of masculinity? What do you think of the idea of masculinity represented in the char character of Troy or his eldest son in this play? Why can Troy, uh, why can this family afford this house? He has a job, yes, but... His brother gets a disability check. So it's a little bit, he always has shame. Troy is ashamed that, Troy is ashamed that he ha the only way he can get this house is because of his brother's disability check, right? So there's an investment, even, we don't, we, things you don't want to talk about, but there's an investment in his brother not moving out. There's an investment in his brother still being there and being disabled, right? He has to, that, that has to be his reality. He loses his house if his brother moves out, if his brother's moved to a facility, or if his brother dies even, right? So there's that dependency on that. What else does this play say about Troy? What, is, what else does this play say about the nature of, ma of Troy's version of masculinity? Jamiron. Uh, I would uh, talk about like, um, his relationship towards his son. Okay. Uh, how, like, uh, Which son? His younger, his younger son. Corey. Uh, how he wanted to play sports. Yeah, his younger son is Corey. Um, and he, uh, we know that Troy, Troy uh, dreamed to work out with sports, and he, and he wanted to let his younger son play sports because I, I feel like he wanted to, him to be realistic. And, uh, and get a job and stuff. And I feel like I really don't understand the relationship. That's why I want to bring it up, because I really don't understand the relationship between... Because he knows it's a different time now, and he still don't want to let him play sports. That's why I want to bring up that topic. I want why to do you it. guys think... Thank you. Why do you guys think uh, Troy won't let Corey play sports? So he won't be disappointed? Um, because Troy thinks the reason why he wasn't able to play sports was because he was black, when really it's because he got old and they didn't want to draft an old guy into the league. Um, but um, So he doesn't want his son to like face that same racism that he thought he 
experience. Okay. So then he's keeping them from it, but really he's just keeping them from opportunity and not even allowing him to have the opportunity to be scouted. Okay. Bull, your hand was up. No, she didn't say so. Okay. Is it, could it be jealousy? That's what I thought it was. Yeah, I was thinking that too. I was thinking it's like he he's getting so many chances like uh, or the void that's being filled to the lack of his uh, discretion and what he's like failing to do is like beyond him and he can't find a way to like uh, come to terms with it so he chooses to fight with his son and like gives him strikes uh, and like at the end when his son mentions like that's like the only way that you're able to have this house is because of your brother like he gets really angry and they start fighting again. So it's like a sort of uh, resentment, I feel, in himself. But he takes it out on others because they're able to do what he's not or what he wish he could have done. Okay. So it's like he's aware, but it's like he, he or he's conscious, but he's taking it out in like in ways that aren't, uh, I guess, uh, reasonable. Marvin. Okay. <laughs> I just feel like he was trying to kind of like protect him because like he didn't want to, to like fall in the same well footsteps as him and like get to that point in his life and have to struggle like that. So, in your opinion, one of the things that's happening is Troy is protecting. Yeah, protecting him from what? <laughs> I, but I want Marvin to give a voice to this. Troy is Sorry. protecting Corey from what? I guess, like, failure, I guess. From oh. failure? Yeah. Possible. That's an absolutely possible answer. Pull your hand came up. I feel it's kind of what he's saying and what he's saying, too. Is this, I mean, uh, like a father, I mean, you got to love your children, so you don't want to follow the same uh, path they took and end up in the same situation as Troy to have adjust and come back again up and, like, get a job and then struggle as he struggled before. You said something really interesting, and I want you to say that out. When I said, uh, what do you think Troy, and I'm not saying either of you are wrong. I agree with both of you. Thank you for adding that. When I said, what is Troy protecting Corey from, you said? America. America, the realities of what it means to be black and male in America. That's, that's also a possibility. Going off that, what you were saying about what did you say about masculinity, I think um, black men tend to use um, their, like, what they go through as a black male in America as an excuse for how they act inside the home. Okay. That is really, that is a good, you know what, if you're going to write a thesis statement for this class, mm -hmm. and you might, that's a really good place to start. I'm just saying. <laughs> so yes, we have to. We have to always. That's what I mean about the complexity of character. Troy's the nature of who and what Troy is, is wildly complex. And literally everything that you have just said, fuels, what makes up that character. That's what I mean by having a layered. That that's a layered character. That is a character who has depth. That is a character who is a fully rounded person. Do you see how that might be different than the comedic character that showed up in the Jeffersons? That's what, that's what August Wilson is doing. He's actually allowing black existence to be a complex thing. Not, not just allowing it, he's doing an artistic rendering of black existence that is complex, that is layered, that is not, that is not simple or easy, right? Yes. How do you think white America kind of took this play? Like, how did they view it? And I mean, like, because it won or was nominated for, like, four Oscars. And, like, Viola Davis won for, like, her. So it was, like... I don't know how white America took this play. Um, I don't know how white people read this play. Yeah. I, because I'm not. Is it, <laughs> is it, like, for them? Or is it, like... Okay, so one of the realities of American theater that we always have to deal with is this. Mm -hmm. Um... If we look at the economic realities of black and white people in most rural, sorry, most urban areas, like even here in New Orleans. In New Orleans, more than 60% of the population is African American. 
but 80 some 80 to 85 or higher percent of the wealth is owned by the white community right yeah. but that's a reality mm -hmm. great so I have a theater company and I want my theater company to be financially <laughs> successful that means I've got to charge 50 let's just I'll be conservative let me say I had to charge $30 for a ticket right the largest portion of the population can't afford my $30 tickets. This past weekend, I went and I saw Raisin in the Sun at Ashe Cultural Center. Mm -hmm. It was $25 to get in and see it. Majority white? No. Oh. And Ashe, they're, they're, okay, so there are groups of black people in New Orleans that were like, you know what, if we're gonna support a theater, we're gonna pick this one. Mm -hmm. um, so I went and saw that, and, it, and there was a largely black audience. But one of the realities here is, if I've got 250 seats or 200 seats in my audience, I've got to market, it, market that to the people who have money. Mm -hmm. So this play, in fact, all of August Wilson's plays are aware of the realities of that, right? It's putting black lives and black existence on screen. We're, can you give me an example that's happening literally right now of a black artist who is centering black identity and black lived experience? There was a recent artist that just got killed over the weekend. His name was Nipsey Hussle. Nipsey Hussle. I was, I was thinking of a movie maker. Now I'm leading you down a path. Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele said something this past week. Because now if you say something, we'll put it on Twitter. <laughs> what did he say? They're mad about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan Peele was, uh, I'm going to paraphrase what he said, but uh, anybody who missed it, he essentially said, he's like, yeah, I'm not interested in casting white guys in my movie because I've seen that movie already. Mm -hmm. Right? Centering blackness, centering the black experience, centering African-American identity is a part of this project. Right? Because for so long in America, and in American history, and America art, American artistic representation, blackness has been marginal or tangential, right? So now we're going, what happens? And it, it, I don't even know if there's necessarily animosity toward the white world. Like, animosity toward the, the dominant culture isn't necessarily a part of this play. It's there. It's the reality. But the playwright himself is saying, you don't concern me. That I spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week thinking about being in white culture. This play, it's about black people being around black people, right? Cool. Uh, talk to me for just a couple seconds about Bono, his best friend. How does that relationship work? I would describe, I'm sorry, let me back up. Troy has several relationships in this play. He has a relationship with Bono. He has a relationship with Ruth. He has a relationship with Corey, right? And you guys are, and you can use the play to talk about or define those relationships. What is the nature of his relationship with his son? We've talked about that already. Is he jealous? Maybe. Is he protecting him? Maybe at some point in time, uh, he says, I don't have to like you. Liking you was not one of the jobs that I signed up for. It's the job of a father to raise his son. To raise his son that, so he can go out into a world that is perhaps hostile and is going to try and kill him. I'm going to give you the skills you need to be strong, to survive. That's his role as a father. But liking him or even loving him is that actually the job of the father? In a country in which so many black men had to leave their families, <clears throat> maybe they were leaving, uh, and we can talk about, we've talked about in this room, about the separation of black men from families. We've talked about what that has to do with uh, the history of slavery. We've talked about what it has to do with in, in, in the context of the great migration. So this play is also dealing with that. Troy is considered a good guy because he stayed, kinda, but he didn't, right? Because he's going to sleep with this other woman. What does fatherhood, what does masculinity, 
all of you people who have to write thesis, uh, thesis statements for your final papers should really be thinking about these kinds of things. What does fatherhood mean? What does manhood mean? Yes, Danielle. You asked in the context of uh, Bono and Troy? Yes. Thank you. I got way off track. All right. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, like, Bono has some sort of, like, not resentment, um, but he sees, like, in Troy, what his father was to him. So, like, I, they had, I guess, they had a conversation or something. Um, I can't remember, but they were telling each other like about their experiences or something. And like, um, in Bono's experience, like his father was like going from woman to woman. I like, couldn't stay put. Um, I, I guess that's what he kind of sees in Troy. So he has like some concern. Okay. Stay on Bono for a second. Tell me about Bono's relationship with his wife. He's like, he's super devoted to his wife. super devoted. And so the playwright gives us a representation of a man who is in fact devoted to his woman. Right? Yeah. Troy exists. Bono ex is a foil opposite Bono. Bono's existence in this play actually shows us more of the tarnish on Troy. Yeah, so I, think it, it, I don't think the movie really implies it, but I feel like uh, Bono kind of puts himself in like puts himself in like his son's shoes or like Troy's son's shoes in some way. Like I don't know. I'm just trying to make connections, but I guess how he kind of sees how uh, Troy is like how he was with his father and like his son he doesn't want uh, I guess he doesn't have like some resentment that he actually like vocalizes but he was, they were just like in conversation he was like sharing his experience so I guess like he sees that between uh, Troy and his son and like how Troy uh, and Rose are to each other Bono is a corrective Bono <laughs> do you see Get Out? Yeah. Good. You remember his friend who would keep calling him up going what are you doing? Yeah. You should leave. That's Bono yeah. Bono is literally that, that friend calling you up going, you about to mess up. Okay, you done messed up. Like that's, that, that moment of somebody, uh, the interjection or the interlocutor, I think is the big college -y word for it. Yes? I think Troy's representation of what a man is supposed to be changes um, when, whoever it's directed to. Okay. So when his relationship with Bono, he's going to like boast about women or all these women that he have or you know like he's like they're drinking like all the time like you know that's his idea of being a man when he's with Bono and then to his son or freedom or freedom Elaborate. huh what does that mean <laughs> what do you mean by that does he does he get to be free with with Bono he gets to tell his story. He actually gets to be kind of a star. He gets to be entertaining and fun. So his relationship with Bono, it's carefree, kind of. It's a double whammy, though. It's a double whammy, though. Why? Because he gets that. He can, in a sense, be carefree, but not too carefree because like, Bono isn't passing judgment on him, and he's not going to let him, like, Slip or he'll. he'll oh no, he's totally past the judgment. Well, he. I mean, he is, but like I'm. I'm saying, like, in context of his head, like he's 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 conscious of it, like you know. Yeah. So I mean, he he he's a man. At the end of the day, he's he's going. He's he'll say something or he'll like he's going to let a man be a man. But like he's he's very conscious of it. Like he knows. But I could tell by like that conversation that they had. Yeah, that but Bono aware. moves away from him at the end of the play. Yeah, Bono's so he, like he let, like that's what I'm saying. It's a double whammy. Like he he thinks like, he he just removes himself. Like you know he'd rather not engage or he rather just let that be him. I'm gonna let you sink on this ship all in your life. Yeah, lungs. got it. Good. I saw a hand back there. All right, good. So we've got about four minutes left, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to close this discussion, and I want you guys to think about things. One, the plays that we're studying in this class from Langston Hughes to um, Lynn Nottage to Pearl Klieg. All of these plays are in fact in conversation with each other. I want you to think about uh, for colored girls who've committed suicide when the rainbow is enough 
in relationship to this play. For colored girls, we've got Ntozaka Shange, who is voicing and taking the place of, or, or she's allowing a black woman's voice to be heard. These are the private thoughts of a black woman. This is the private world that we've always been told not to show to the public, right? In the same way, August Wilson is with plays like Fences and the entire Philadelphia, uh, sorry, Pittsburgh cycle moving the private lives of black identity into the center of the artistic mission, right? I want you guys to think about what that means in terms of in context with each other, not necessarily Ntozaka Shanghe uh, and August Wilson, but absolutely those two, as well as Passover, which we watched in class. In what way is the movie or the, the film of the play Passover also still in conversation with this play, right? So in Passover, they can't get off that corner. They're stuck. They can't go anywhere. Much like Troy, who is stuck and can't go anywhere, right? Much like the women in For Colored Girls are stuck and can't go anywhere. What does that say about black existence? What does that say about the nature? What, is, what are black artists saying about the nature of black existence? So that's what I want to leave you with. Please, all of you, Read, you will, you will get a pop quiz on this play, Fences, and you'll get a pop quiz on uh, T-Bone and Weasel on Thursday. And we'll talk about T-Bone and Weasel on Thursday. Thank you. Have a great day. You can watch Lectures in History every weekend on American History TV. We take you inside college classrooms to learn about topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. That's Saturday at 8 p.m. at midnight Eastern on C-SPAN 3.